Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or whatever time it is that you're watching. My name is Minister Wallace. I am coming to you from the New Life Bible Church YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I thank you for clicking on it. Uh, I don't know what day it is that you're watching it, but the day that this premieres is July the 17th, 2022. And it is a, uh, as the old preachers used, used to say, it is a, uh, it, it, it's a beautiful day in the Lord. Uh, I thank you again for click, clicking on the channel on behalf of my pastor, which is the founding pastor of New Life Bible Church, Dr. Alan S. McLaughlin. Uh, I, I thank him for sharing his pulpit and um, YouTube ministry with the ministers um, of his church. And our first lady, Dr. Norma McLaughlin, thank you uh, uh, for the same, for many, many years of mentorship and guidance. So with that, we are, since I can't sing, uh, I used to know how to dance, I didn't, uh, but we are going to go into what I believe, I, I think <clears throat> the purpose, one of the primary purposes, I think, I, I say I think, but I'm very confident that uh, um, one of the primary purposes of the church, uh, along with propagating God's word, spreading God's word, uh, uh, uh offering the eternal sal sal salvation through Jesus Christ. One of those um, uh, uh, tasks that fall down below that is encouragement, basic in encouragement. I just have, over the years, have come to understand, come to believe, and come to trust that encouragement, all of us need encouragement. We thrive off of it. I mean, there are, have been some amazing things done by another human that was simply encouraged. So this morning, uh, we're going to answer the question from the title you've seen. Many of you, depending on what age you are, when you've seen the title, you thought of one person and it wasn't the Lord. Uh, you thought of Tina Turner. Uh, uh, to be completely honest, uh, when I was, uh, as I was going through the the passage, uh, that's what I thought of too. Uh, when I realized and, and understood uh, what led me to the passage and what this passage is about, uh, it, 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 that's the thing that I thought too, man, what, that would be a great title. What's love got to do with it? Well, we're going to answer that question and learn more about that question through 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 13. Uh, in the song from the 1990s, uh, Tina Turner asked, What's love got to do with it? Now, of course, she was in the midst, well, I think, in the midst of a coming through on the backside of a failed relationship, had married a, uh, one of those swab dudes, you know, with the green eyes, nice hair, hair always straight, don't even have to brush it, uh, uh, but turned out to be a complete crazy man. Uh, and, and I think, if memory serves me correctly, I was a kid when it came out, but um, um, it, uh, well, not a kid when it came out, but probably when she was going, going through it. Um, when the song came out, her assessment of love is that it was just, it was useless. It was a secondhand emotion. Uh, it was basically nothing. Uh, and she was saying that based on her experience. Um, not, not to answer that song. That's not what we're doing, but that is a thought process that love is just an emotion. Love is one of those words and terms that we use for many things that I use for many, many things. But so we're going to, we're going to take a look at what the Bible says about what love is and what it looks like without it. Uh, and not just in relationships, because sometimes we only attach love to relationships. Sometimes it's misunderstood uh, in the Bible. Uh, well, it's misunderstood by us what the Bible is referring to a lot of times when it's talking about relationships. Usually we are understanding intimate relationships, girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, uh, mom, parents, but we'll, we're going to kind of expand the aperture a little this morning. Um, so what we have to do though, before we jump right into 1 Corinthians 13, we have to look at some of the preceding passages. And I'm going to be honest, <clears throat> this is not what I was in, uh, as of four days ago, this is not what I was intending to preach. I was studying 1 Corinthians 12. I felt like that's where God was leading me. Uh, I, I wanted to teach a message or preach a message on unity, on, on working together, uh, uh, how we are, how we are absolutely, and the we that I'm talking about, asterisk, everybody. 
how we are better together. So I was in chapter 12. I was pretty excited about chap chapter 12 too as I began to read through it. Because uh, Paul kept talking about Paul was juxtaposing uh, the body, the human body, with the body of Christ. You see, the Corinthians, like us, were having some issues. Uh, they were from a place of, uh, they had a lot of things. They had a lot of ma material things. Uh, and so they struggled a bit with, uh, because the things that are happening at work and at home and in the family, at your jobs or whatever it is, the things that are happening outside of the church come inside the church. Why? Because the humans who are causing or living or experiencing those things, we come into the church. So when the local church meets, guess what we guess what we bring in? Well, we bring in all the Lent and all the things and all the stuff from the world. So the church at Corinth was having an issue. So, and Paul was trying to unify them. So I thought, 1 Corinthians 12, that's it. I'm reading 1 Corinthians 12. It's getting gooder and gooder. Paul is juxtaposing the body with the eyes and he says the eye can't be the whole body he's making the point that how uh, the body works together each one of them have different parts they don't look alike uh, the, so the lower one can be the higher one and I'm thinking man this is good this is good I'm reading and everything getting super and super excited I'm done with almost done with the reading almost to the last verse and I'm thinking, okay, uh, two or three points. Man, this is going to be good. Some transitions, because I was getting excited. I, I really only try, I preach things that if, if so I believe when God lays something on your heart, first it's going to be for me, it's going to excite me, or it's going to touch me or whatever it is, but it's going to have some type of response with me first, because I can't just, I don't think, well, for me, that's how, how it works. So I'm excited. I get down to the last verse. Now, Paul has laid it down in chapter 12. I get down to the last verse and he says, but wait, I'm going to show you something far better. And I'm like, well, wait, far better. Now, he could have said, I'm going to show you something better. I'm going to show you something as good. But no, he picks the last verse to close off that portion of text. He picks the last verse to say, but wait, I'm going to show you something far better. I mean, if, 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 if you have something that's good, and I thought 1 Corinthians 12 was good, I'm ready to start putting the message together, start prepping and everything. But if somebody says, hey, you got something good, but I can offer you something far better. Paul closes out 1 Corinthians 12, the very last verse says, but wait, I'm going to show you something far better. So, in chapter 12, he was talking about spiritual gifts. He was talking about natural gifts. He was talking about working together. He was talking about the pinnacle of spiritual gifts. Uh, he said, so, I mean, things like, in a sense, to translate to us, what could be far better than being the best singer? He talked about physical gifts. And what, what, what could be far better than being able to speak tongues on command? I mean, you super saved at that point. What could be far better than being the best teacher, the best organist? What could be far better than being the person who's known as the best drummer, the best usher, the best pastor, the best preacher, the most nicest person in the church? What could be far better than that? Well, let's find out. Because Paul, the Bible, changed my whole direction as I was reading through and studying the text because in the last verse of 1 Corinthians 12, where I was going to set up camp at, he tells me, but wait, there is something far better. Paul's focus in 1 Corinthians 12 is this. The idea of 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, uh, Paul's focus of 1 Corinthians 13, the idea, the overall, the primary idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is this. No matter what talents or gifts that you have, they and you are nothing without the application of love. Paul's point in 1 Corinthians 13 is this, that no matter what talents you have, no matter what spiritual gifts that you have, they, those gifts, those talents, they are nothing without the application of love. I watched this dude called uh, No Life Shack. Uh, he does reaction videos to music that, that, that some of you may not like. 
Uh, he does reaction videos to hip hop music. Uh, and he, but he's got this phrase that he says whenever it was a line, whenever it was a bar, he's like, that's tough. That's tough. When you understand the thrust, the main point of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible is saying that no matter what talents you have, you can shoot threes from the perimeter without even looking. You can, you can set the church on fire with a song. You are the hands down best planner at the church. You got promoted faster than anybody in your entire battalion. You was an E7 in six and a half years. You got a legion of merit and you didn't even retire. You are the most awesome person. Everybody at church knows you are awesome. The Bible says, even with that, if it's not done with love, it means nothing. And you mean nothing. That's tough. That's tough. That's tough. That, that makes me ask, well, what does love have to do with it? What is it about love? Because I'm missing something about love. Because, I mean, I love cheeseburgers. I love sausage and pancakes and eggs. I love, I, 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 I love sports cars. I love my wife. I love my grandson. I love my church. Something's wrong here because, see, I wasn't getting that. I thought if I was, you know, if I, if, I mean, if I had a buttery smooth jumper, I mean, if I got a voice that I ain't even got to try and I can basically sing better than everybody in the choir, I mean, if I got just skills and I don't even have to try, I mean, don't that count for something? The Bible says, if it's not applied with love, no, it means nothing. And nor do you in God's eyes. Your talents and gifts mean nothing if they are not applied with love. Now, this is in God's eyes. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. The Bible says, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In the original Greek, it's not talking necessarily of that's what it is. It's making an idiom to say it's temporary. It's just, it's just sounds. And then when it's over, it's done. The point of verse one is that, that the Bible is saying that if you speak in, in these things and speaking in tongue, Tongues of men and of angels. You're thinking of angels. I mean, come on now, of angels. The Bible says, but if you don't have love, it's a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. It's just noise. And when it stops, it's gone. So it's temporary. Verse 2 says, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge and have all faith so as to move mountains, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Have I been reading the same Bible? Have I just been slicing the Bible up into little pieces of pie? Have I not been collectively understanding God's word? Because this don't sound right. Somebody told me, a preacher told me, you got faith the size of a monster seed. You can move mountains. And everybody said, amen. Didn't nobody say this part? Did nobody tell me this? It means nothing, nothing. You can have the faith. Let me read what the Bible says and let me not paraphrase. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, prophetic powers? 90% of the churches I go to, you already the man. And if you understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith, I just want a portion of faith. The Bible says, and if you got all faith and you can move mountains, but you don't have love, nothing, nothing. <laughs> Let's continue. Verse three, if I give away all I have and deliver my body up to be burned, Paul, the first three verses is just breaking in half all the things sometimes that we get taught one side of it. If I give away all I have, charity, everything, if I give from my heart, and I deliver up my body to be burned, the ultimate sac sacrifice, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. None of that means anything. So love is better, is, is, is not just better than, the Bible is saying without love, all the above is wrong. So 
I, I, I uh, probably uh, 15, 20 years ago uh, was one of the first times I was able to go to like a real upscale steakhouse. I mean, this is pinky up, white towel, little warm finger bowl stuff to, you know, all the little stuff, the spritz and the soft music and the lights were down. Uh, you know, they come seat you. You can even see nobody around you. Uh, the top level steaks, stay at house. I've never been in there. I like, no matter what it is, if it's steak, uh, hamburgers, french fries, I like some sauce. I like Heinz 57 sauce. I like steak sauce or barbecue sauce or ketchup. I just like sauce. I think that sauce makes everything better. If you got a, an incredible steak, I think sauce makes it awesome. If you got an awesome steak, put a little sauce on it, it's phenomenal. I don't, I divorce the, the seasoning, the, of course the meat is seasoned or not. If it's a terrible steak, you put some sauce on it, it's all right. So I'm at this upscale steakhouse, word of a steak, ribeye, I like it. It comes out. Now I'm trying to be responsible, right? I don't want to wait till the, till the waiter has to go all the way back. The waiter delivers the steak. And the first question I ask him, now those of you who've been to a upscale steakhouse, you already know the mistake that I'm getting ready to make. The first question I ask him, hey, could, could you bring some Heinz 57 sauce? I said it in my very professional and soft inside, like I got some home training and voice. And I could tell the look on his face went to a not, he wasn't disgusted, he felt sorry for me. It was kind of like one of those, oh, uh, he was like, you, you not gonna taste it? My thing was, and I was kind of like, I'm gonna taste it as soon as you bring the sauce. I mean, <laughs> but his point was, his implicit point was, you need to taste it first. My point is, and what I've always believed, is that without some type of sauce, I feel like you're missing something. I feel like the sauce makes everything better. You keep that in mind and you contrast that with Paul takes love a step further. Love, Paul says, no, 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 love doesn't make something better. Paul says, if you don't add love into everything that you do, it's nothing. Paul says without love, see for me, without sauce, it's just okay. Paul says, uh-uh, it's not okay. The Bible says your behavior, your talents, your gifts, all those wonderful things you do, if it's not doused with love, it means nothing. Wow, wow. If Jesus was sitting over in the corner, Jesus would have his arms full like I told you. I told you already. I told you that in Matthew 22. I told you the greatest commandment is love. Paul, he, he's, he's driving home the point that it's nothing. It's useless. So since we don't want to be useless, since we don't want to be nothing in God's eyes, in God's eyes, do not get me wrong here. I'm talking in God's eyes to other folks. You're incredible. Fantastic. Your jumper is deadly. You preach out the church. You set the choir on fire. You the best sing, singer too. You know, folks will whisper stuff in your ear that's actually kind of foul. They're trying to compliment you. You know, you could sing by yourself without everybody else. You know, you, 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 you do this and this the best. So, but since we want to excel in God's eyes, we also want to excel well within the world, but we want to excel in God's eyes. And since we want to strive to be something, let's dive in and see what does love have to do with it. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 13 says that love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, love does not brag, it is not puffed up, it is not rude, it is not self-serving, it is not easily angered or resentful, it is not glad about injustice, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But... If there are prophecies, they will be set aside. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be set aside. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be set aside. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. Uh, uh, I act like a child. I reason like a child. But when I became an adult, I set aside childish ways. Paul here is talking about spiritual maturity, that maturing and growing in your ways. He's making the point to the Corinthians. I'm making the point to you. This is why love is so important. He, he starts to conclude in verse 12, for now we see in a mirror indirectly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but when I will, but, but then I will fully know. 
just as I have been fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these in love is love. What's love got to do with it? Two quick basic points. The first one, without love, without love, your actions are temporary. Without love, your actions are temporary. That's what Paul meant when he was driving home the point that it's just a noisy gong, a symbol. It's not that it's just noise. Well, it could just be noise. You, you could take it in that sense too. But the thing is, at some point, they cease and that's it. It's temporary. Without love, your actions, your deeds, the things that you do, the things that you say, they are temporary. Soon as they are done, they're done without love. Why is that? Well, here's some attributes of what love does not do. Here's some things that give you indicators of what to avoid. Or when you do them, and we will, as John the Baptist said, repent, change. Oh man, I messed that up. I need to fix that. Go back, fix it if possible. Here are some things that love does not do. Here are some temporary things, some indicators that if you are doing these and acting like this, these are temporary. These, these have no long lasting effects. Now, uh, hurt can hurt folks for a very long time. That's not the point here, but these are the opposite of love. In the scripture, it says love, love does not brag. Now, it's not talking about bragging on your kids, but bragging from a position of superiority. Love is not puffed up, swole, swole up, prideful. Not prideful as in low uh, uh, self-esteem, but prideful in, it, in, in that I think I'm better than you, period. Fundamentally just better than you because of X, Y, and Z. Love is not rude. I mean, that's, that's Captain Obvious there. You cannot be just, just rude all the time. You cannot, well, that's, that's the way I am. Change, because that is temporary, it's useless. Love is not envious. Now, if we Google envious, we get a, we get a definition that's not accurate. Envy is not just simply, uh, some people, people think envy is just simply, I see something that I like that somebody has or has done. Wow, man, I like that uh, he paid for his house in six, 16 years. Man, I'm going to do, do, do that. That's not envious. Envy, here's, here's when you know it, whatever it is, turns into envy. When you become resentful, when you, be, when you become dissatisfied in yourself. When it turns, turns in you, what are you trying to pay his house off for? See, that's why I ain't got, 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 got nothing. If I had a better job, that now it's done turning into envy that you want what somebody has and that emotion turns into resent and dissatisfied. There is absolutely nothing wrong with seeing somebody else achieve something and you want to do it. Newsflash, 99%, if not 100% of what you do it's because you've been inspired by, influenced by, touched by, or seen someone else. Wake up. It's okay to be influenced. What the Bible is talking about is not envious. When it turns into envy, why they got this church in my little church, or, or, why, or, or why they church so small. Envy is when the, that emotion, that what you see, it turns into resent or divide, uh, or, uh, or you being dissatisfied. Love is not self-serving. The Bible says in the text that you got that love is not self-serving. Love is not easily angered or resentful. We may need to let that one soak in for a little bit. Love is not easily angered or resentful. Love is not glad about injustice. Love doesn't do what we used to do when we was kids. You see somebody get, get messed over something. Ha, ah, goody. See, that, love is not is not glad about injustice, no matter who gets it. Somebody gets something that they didn't deserve, and that's not right. They don't have to look like you, talk like you, dress like you. They could have been wrong to you last week. If somebody wrongs them, love is not happy about that. Uh, Paul says in Philippians 2, uh, verses 3 through 4, it says, the Bible says, instead of being motivated by self-ambition, which most of that, what the Bible said above uh, about what love is not, Paul says, instead of being more motivated by self-ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. That's tough. 
Each of you should be concerned not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others as well. What's love got to do with it? We don't want love. We don't want our actions to be temporary. We want them to be eternal. Second point, with love, your actions are eternal. With love, your actions, your talent, the things that you do, when you do them in love, they are eternal. So what is the Bible talking about? What is, what's, the, what's the biblical definition of love? What is it? Here it is, right here. Verse, the, uh, the, uh, it, it's a couple of them spread out in one of the other verses, but right after verse 6, latter part of verse 6, Love is patient. That's tough. That's tough for me. Love is kind. Love rejoices in the truth. Not love rejoices in the truth that comes from somebody who looks like me. No. Love rejoices in the truth. Whatever the truth is. Hmm. Man, I, you know what? I don't like uh, Ralph, but uh, he's right. Uh, he's, he or she is right. Love rejoices in the truth. This is a biblical explanation, y'all, of what biblically what love is. Love bears all things. Now that word bears, I mean, protects. Love is a protector. Whether it be uh, integrity, whether it be truth, whether it be someone who's helpless, or whether it be somebody who's rich, it doesn't matter. Love is a protector. Love believes all things. Now, that's not literally you have to believe everything that everybody says. No, the interpretation here is that love trust. Now, if you're going to extend trust, let me give you a newsflash. It's not, not for me, but I can tell you from experience, but this is from God's words too. If you're going to extend trust, I'm going to warn you, you're going to be hurt, period. If you are going to extend trust, you are going to be hurt, period. Conversely, if you don't extend trust and you try to take the OG gangster attitude, I don't trust nobody, what's up? Your heart will die. I didn't say you will die. I said your heart will die. Not your physical heart, but your ability to show compassion, your ability to show emotion will die off with your keeping it real, I don't trust nobody attitude. Your heart it needs that. We need to trust folks. And yes, slash, comma, you're going to get hurt. If you extend trust, you're going to get hurt. Conversely, every person of means, whatever that means is, they've extended some money. They've lost some money. Every person who, whatever you call rich, I guarantee you, they've lost some money. Most folks who are not of whatever means it is, they've never tried. Love, love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Now, we know what that one means, but, but it, it may not be all the time. There are things that can shake you. There are things that can hit you. I heard a preacher say about three or four weeks ago, there's things that can bend you back, but you should be able to spring back because love hopes all things. We don't expect the Christian to be the one who is spreading the, ain't nothing going to change. It's going, oh, we doomed now. Run and hide, y'all. We don't expect the believer to say that. We don't expect. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. It perseveres. It perseveres. I guarantee you, if you're watching this, you have pushed through some stuff. You need to let other folks know the way you show love. If you push through some stuff, one of the ways you show love is when somebody is in that stuff that you was in. That's not the time to criticize. No lifeguard uh, looks out there and sees somebody drowning and say, what was you doing out there? Why, why are you out in the deep end? We, we got swimming lessons every Tuesday. I'm going to check the rules. I don't see you on there. That's not the time, Christians. When folks is in their mess, that's not the time. That's not the time to try to, oh, well, you should have been. Well, if you No, the time is to throw the life preserver. Get them in. Let's dry them off. Then we may be able to talk about some swimming lessons or whatever it is. Love endures all things. It, it, it perseveres. You persevere. The way you show love is to show someone else hope. 
Love never ends. And he puts the stamp on it there. Love is eternal. In the top of verse 8, he gives an attribute. Love never ends. So yeah, with love, your actions are eternal. With love, you showing love. You remember things that your great grandma did, grand grandfather, mom, dad, whoever, a person who was just who, who just did something in passing. You remember that to this day. Love is eternal. Listen to Romans chapter 12, verse 9, 9 through 10. The Bible says, love must be without hypocrisy. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Don't cling to what is evil. Well, I just need to know what the news says every single day, every minute, streaming to my phone, alerts, smart TV set to the news. Have, have, have y'all noticed? I don't, I don't, it's not that I don't like, like the news. I don't like what it does to folks. Every single minute of thing. Hey, hey, did you, did you hear it? Finish reading it first before you tell me about it. You ain't even read it. Hey, did you hear it? Uh, uh, did you? Love. Love does not do that. I didn't say love don't watch the news. I said love doesn't cling to it. It doesn't cling to those things. Love clings to what's good. Be devoted to one another with mutual love, showing eagerness in honoring one another. What does love have to do with it? Everything. Everything. I'll give you this challenge before we close. I want you to take the time this week. The Bible tells, 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 tells us, it kind of implies, not saying that we should love those who love, love us, but the Bible kind of uh, explicitly states that that's great and that's an easy task. I want to challenge you with this for this week, next week, whenever you feel uncomfortable doing it. Notice I didn't say whenever you feel comfortable because that may never happen. I'm talking about at the point where you feel a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit weird. I want you to take the time to show somebody love who don't like you. Some, somebody who, it may not be a, 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 a overt don't like you, but it's kind of, it's known. You know, she know too. Y'all speak, see each other. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's up? I like that dress. I don't really, but hey. No, I want you to take some time this week. Something, don't be weird about it, but something. Show them love. Show them, show them love. It's not hard to do. And it's eternal. And don't forget, Paul says, without it, we are nothing. So again, what does love have to do with it? It has everything to do, do, do with it. And us as Christians, in God's eyes, we want to not be temporary. We want to show love. We want to draw as many folks to us so we can tell them, like John the Baptist did, it ain't even me. I ain't even worthy to tie his sandal. But since you came here, let me point you to the man. Well, let me point you to the reason I am the way that I am. That's the point, And that's what love has to do with. I thank y'all for tuning in this morning or whatever time it is that you watch. Uh, I hope that you accept the challenge to show somebody love who may not like you or may not. That would be the first one or somebody who you may not know. Just it's nothing wrong with showing somebody some love, being kind, smile, encourage, show somebody some love. These baby steps will take gigantic leaps and to make our world a better place. Our Father, which art in heaven, we come before you, God, first to give you all praise and honor and glory. I thank you, God, for this audience. I thank you, God, for your word. And we just ask, God, you continue to guide us and lead us and allow us to be able to have a spirit of boldness to show somebody some love this week. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. Thank you, New Life. Thank you, friends of New, New, New Life. Thank you for folks that the YouTube algorithm dropped this in your lap. God bless you and have a great week. Amen.